So we've started a series through the book of Romans. And today, I need extra grace. Amen? Um, oh, before I forget, how dare I? Guys, please give a warm welcome to Pastor Tendai, all the way from Eswatini, who's here with us this morning from the kingdom of Eswatini, and um, it's a joy to have you joining us this Sunday, and, uh, and next time you're in town, you won't be let off so lightly, um, we'd want to hear you minister for us. Um, so, the book of Romans, so I need extra grace this morning, because we're going to be dealing with some difficult passages in the book of Romans chapter 1. Some passages that have been misunderstood, some passages that really cut across some of our preferences, some of the things that we think the Bible is outdated on. And so it's going to really challenge us as we go to the Word of God to say, God, what are you saying? In the book of James, James says this, James chapter 1, he says that we need to approach the Word of God with humility. Every single one of us. The Bible, the Word of God is able to save us, but we need to approach it with the prerequisite humility. Not lifting up our thoughts, our ideas, the preferences of culture, the zeitgeist of the age that we live in. No, we are to look at the Word of God and say, God, what are you saying? And humble ourselves. And so, Father God, I pray this morning, as we dive into your Word, that, Father, you'll give us humility. You'd give us humility. Father, pour out your spirit of wisdom and revelation. Reveal yourself to us today. We don't want to come in assumptions and presumptions. We want you to speak to us. Speak, Lord. Your children are listening. And the people of God said, Amen, Amen, Amen and Amen. So we're in Romans chapter 1. The book of Romans is phenomenal. The book of Romans is where Paul articulates the depths of the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, like nowhere else in Scripture. It's often been said that if you understand the book of Romans well, it will mature you as a believer. Someone put it so boldly as to say that if you understand the first nine or ten chapters of the book of Romans, it will make you a mature believer. I think that the point is underscored well. And you can look out throughout church history and see life after life after life that has been changed by the truths contained in the book of Romans. My own life was rocked when I heard for the first time Romans 8 verse 1. The Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And as a young Christian struggling in my faith, struggling to overcome some sin issues in my life, I always felt God loved me, He loved me not. He loved me, He loved me not. Until I finally understood, reading Romans chapter 8 verse 1, that no, 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 He loves me. Amen. He loves me. I don't have to live under the weight of condemnation. I can rise above and walk in the Spirit and walk with God and not according to the flesh. Powerful, powerful, powerful truths. Amen. Amen. Last week, we ended off with our memory verse. And this really is a memory verse because it exhibits... Uh, whoa, where are we? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Who, who, who's behind there? Atle, is that you? I see you, Atle. Okay, Romans 1, verse 16 and 17. This is our memory verse. And these two verses are like a mini summary of the entire book of Romans. So if you want the summary, the quick notes, the wiki on the book of Romans, here it is. For I am not ashamed of the gospel... Now, the word gospel means good news. And here Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation, to rescue people. Isn't that powerful? For everyone who believes in it, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. 
for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Mm. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Thank you for memorizing that verse. <clears throat> and here Paul is sharing the good news, the brilliant news, that Jesus Christ came to save mankind. And he gives us a righteousness, a right standing. Remember that word righteousness means right standing. He gives us a right standing with God that we don't earn, that we don't deserve. He gives it to us. He imputes it to us. This is just so amazing. But then the very next verse, verse, nine, verse 18, Paul then goes on to the bad news. So if you want a summary of um, t- today's talk is the good news. And the bad news. Why do we need salvation? Why do we need rescuing? And Paul starts to build an argument of why Jesus' good news is good news. Because you don't understand the good news unless you understand the bad news. So he starts off in verse 19 by articulating the bad news. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Wow. You know, we started off basking in the good news of what Jesus did on the cross for us, but then Paul goes on to say, but you need to understand why this good news is good news. Because the wrath of God is revealed. Wow. This begs a question. This begs a question. Why would God be full of wrath? Why? John Stott, theologian and pastor, says this. You need to understand that God's wrath is not like our anger. It's not like a personal tiff. He's not being emotional. He's not having a bad day. When we talk about God's wrath, we're talking about his holy hostility to evil. His refusal to condone it or to come to terms with it. His just judgment upon it. So when we're talking about the concept of God's wrath, Let me give you this example. Imagine an engineer who's just made his first motor car. And it's a masterpiece. There's nothing like it in all the world. He's put all his creativity, energy into creating this automobile. And he parks it in front of his house and marvels at it as he looks outside of his house. But as he's looking at his masterpiece, he sees some hooligans. And they come and first they scratch the car. Then someone slashes the wheels. And then they start to jump on the car and they start to break the windows. Now, if you and I are looking at that scene, we'd be angry and upset. But it would be nothing compared to what the person who made it feels. You see, when God is talking about his wrath towards all ungodliness and all unrighteousness, these are the things that distort and pervert who we are created to be. Now, when we talk about ungodliness, we're talking about the things we do when we cut off God. We we act and behave as if there is no God. Now, theologians say that you could talk about ungodliness in terms of the first Five of the Ten Commandments, which all deal with how we relate to God. And unrighteousness is the second five of the Ten Commandments, which deal with how we relate to other people. So whenever there's a breaking of the rule and the way that God has created things to be, God is consumed in wrath because that is not how it is meant to be. 
It's not fashionable these days to talk about the wrath of God. It's not fashionable. Some people like, you know, we just like cross this out of the Bible. Like it does not exist. But Paul started here because you can't understand the good news until you understand the bad news. You saw what were we saved from? Verse 16. What, were, what was God so desperate to save us from? Was it from sin? Was it from unrighteousness? No, no, no. God was most desperate to save us from His own wrath. His own wrath. It was the late theologian. I seem to be quoting late theologians a lot of late. Maybe I should find some living ones. David Pawson, great British teacher, he put it this way when talking about the wrath of God. He says, the worst thing that can happen to a person is for them to live their lives thinking that they're on the right side of God, only to die and stand before God and find out that they were in the wrong. The worst thing that can happen to any one of us is to think we're good. Meanwhile, we're not good. So understanding what makes for the wrath of God to be meted out is so crucial. Let's carry on. So, why is God so angry? Verse 19. Because what we have known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that were made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, reading this scripture here, we, we can like look at it and say, this is so unfair. This is so unfair. God, what do you mean you've revealed yourself to us? Sure, I'm a Christian, I read my Bible, etc., but I look at people outside of the church. How can you say you've revealed yourself to them? I'm glad you asked. Because have you ever noticed that just before you're about to do something bad, it's like an alarm bell goes off in your mind. Just as you're about to do something bad, an alarm bell goes off. And it's amazing how God has placed inside of every human being a sense of conscience. A sense of what's right and a sense of what's wrong. Not only do we have a sense of conscience when we're about to do something wrong, but it's a universal truth. Wherever you go, remote tribes and, and to the middle of the biggest urban centers, it is a universal truth that it is better to love your neighbor than to eat your neighbor. Wherever you go. And that these universal truths, these moral laws that God has placed that make us think there's something that we have a sense of accountability to. The Bible says that God has written His law in our hearts that we might not sin against Him. Wow. But not only do we sense God when, when, when our, our conscious alerts us to something or, or when we, we, we've just got an innate sense of the right thing to do in a situation, but we also get a sense of God's awe and wonder when we're standing on the beach or we're out in nature and we're captivated by the beauty that we see in the world around us. There's something inside of us that screams, wow. If this is so beautiful, there must be someone who has made this beautiful creation. Or maybe it's when you saw your child born and you're holding your child in your hands for the very first time and you knew 
that this was way beyond anything you were capable of doing in your own strength. God has revealed himself to us. When you look deeper and closer, you start to see God more and more. Have you ever thought about how the cosmos started? Scientists agree, and cosmologists specifically, that the world started with the Big Bang. Even people like Stephen Hawkins agree that the world started with a Big Bang. And the question is, if there was a Big Bang, who pulled the trigger? There was something that created everything to spring into life. And when you read the opening pages of the Bible, it tells us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we might pass over that, but Timber, why are you laboring this point about creation and God and all of that? Because you see, once you understand that there's a creator, there's a sense of accountability to this creator. Because if there's a creator, we are the creation. Oh, but Timber, yeah, you know, Big Bang, you know, it's, it's, it's debatable. You know, I'd give you one out of ten for that. But what else is there when we look at nature? I'm glad you asked. Because scientists will tell you that even scientists who do not believe in God will agree that the universe is finely tuned mysteriously to sustain life. And the fine tuning of the universe is such a powerful truth. Let's look at a couple of factors. Number one, gravity. The gravity in the universe. You know there's gravity in the universe, not just on earth? Okay, good, good. And if the gravitational forces were just a little bit weaker or a little bit stronger, our planet system would not exist. The whole universe would either collapse on itself or would like unravel. Just a tiny bit this way, a tiny bit that way. Look at gravity on earth. If gravity on earth was a little stronger, we wouldn't be able to walk. We wouldn't be able to live. If it was a little bit weaker, we'd be floating around. Now, I, I think that would be quite cool, actually. But anyway. <laughs> and there are hundreds, literally hundreds of these constants that if they are out of kilter just by a fraction of a fraction of a fraction, I'm talking about some of them 10 to the 40th power. If they're out just by 10 to the 40th power, life on earth the whole of earth would not be possible. I'm talking about things like um, carbon, for example, and its ability to bind. If it was out just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction, life as we know it would not be possible. So there's the fine-tuning of the universe. If we were just a bit closer to the sun, our planet would burn up. If we were just a bit further from the sun, we're all freeze to death. The fine-tuning of the universe points to the fact that there must be a creator. Now, some of you are like, well, but Timber, this is like, you know, the evolution. Darwin came up with evolution. And Michael Behe, about 20 years ago, wrote a phenomenal book called Darwin's Black Box. And in his book, what he sought to point out was the fact that Darwin himself said this, that if you can find anything in the world, any organism that is irreducibly complex, my whole theory of evolution falls apart. If you can find one thing that is irreducibly complex, so for example, look at a mousetrap. And on the mousetrap, you see that there are different components to that mousetrap. If you remove one of those components, the whole mousetrap won't work, right? If you remove the trigger, then happy days for the mouse, amen? 
We'll eat that cheese and like, you know, leave, <laughs> leave you wondering what's going on. Each part of that mousetrap needs to work together. In exactly the same way, when you look at the world around us, there are things that are irreducibly complex. Again, exploding Darwinism. Let me give you one example of these. The Bombardier Beetle. Now, this beetle is quite phenomenal. Because it protects itself by exploding through its backside... I thought you'd enjoy that. <laughs> By exploding through its backside a gas that burns and scalds anything it comes in contact with. Right? So the question is, how would it be possible for that to evolve within the body of this beetle? Because the, the, the chemicals that it mixes together inside its backside, have to be mixed at exactly the right point in order for the explosion to happen outside the body, not inside the body. And how would, through a process of trial and error over hundreds of years, would it be possible for that to happen? This is irreducibly complex. Now, we could go to the field of paleontology. Dr. Gunther Beachley uh, points out that when you look intently at the fossil record, the fossil record which is supposed to prove evolution is missing. And you can look at stream after stream after stream. Now, his specific area of interest is in insects, the history of insects, and looking at the fossil record of insects. And he says transitionary forms are just not there. They are just not there. If evolution was true, you'd find them if from the Cambrian explosion. You'd find transitionary forms all over the place. They do not exist. They have not been found. And so in 2017, uh, if I get the, right, the date correct, in 2015, um, Gunther came out as a leading paleontologist and said, guys, this stuff is nonsense. <laughs> Our theories don't work. And he came out in favor of intelligent design. And he put it on his website. And you know what happened? This German scientist was fired from his workplace. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And when you look at all of these different discoveries, uh, I want to conclude with DNA because Francis Collin, Collins and um, the Human Genome Project, where, where they, they were responsible for, 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 for going through and helping us to understand the, the correct sequencing of the human DNA. And Francis Collins, who started his scientific career as an atheist and then became a Christian, was leading this project. And in 2020, when they gave that announcement to the whole world that the first draft of the sequencing of the human DNA was complete, he started his talk this way. He said, I'd like to let the world know that we finally have understood the language God used when he spoke us into existence. Amen? Amen? And the wonder of DNA in and of itself points to the fact, its complexity, its intricate nature, the sequencing of it, that there must be an intelligent mind behind creation. They must be a creator. Atheists like Anthony Flew abandoned atheism, and I quote, because of his conclusion that intelligence must have been involved in the origin of our very DNA. Close quote. There's a creator. We are the creation. Verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him 
as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them up to uncleanliness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Now, this passage of Scripture, Lord, help us to understand this. I want to draw your attention first and foremost that one of the evidences of the wrath of God in operation is not that God brings out his cane like the schoolmaster and says, naughty, 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 kids. One of the scariest exhibitions of the wrath of God is that God gives us over to the things we are hell-bent on doing. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the, lust, in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to their vile passions. For even their women exchanged their natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving their natural use for the women, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. This passage of Scripture, so controversial in our day, so controversial. Here Paul is talking about homosexuality. And is talking about homosexuality as God giving us over to our passions and sins. And I think as a church, there are four things that we need as we respond to the issue of homosexuality in our day. Number one, we need compassion. Compassion. I think for too long, the church has been judgmental, angry, and hateful to people caught up in the sin of homosexuality. For too long as the church, we've elevated homosexuality into a category of sin greater than any other sin. And that's not true. It's not true. As a church, we need to stand up and say that it's wrong for anybody to be murdered, beaten, and tortured. Anybody, for any reason. It's wrong for homosexual people to live in fear of their lives. It's wrong. And as a church, we've got to be at the forefront. And where we have been leading the biases, we have got to repent as the church. Point one of four. We need to lead with compassion. We need to love gay people. Number two. As a church, we need to respond to the issue of homosexuality with clarity. With clarity. You, you know, the Bible is not a book of opinions that I am supposed to like, like everything. In fact, God is, likes to remind me that his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. Higher, as high as the clouds are above the heaven, so far is the Lord's way of thinking from mine. It's not trying to bring our personal preferences into the text. It's learning to submit ourselves to what does the word of God say on this matter. Because it's not just this matter of homosexuality, but it's all sexual sin. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And here the Bible gives us great clarity. Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that's sex outside of marriage, mm -hmm. nor idolaters, that means you're putting something above God. Maybe it's your sport. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your relationship. You're putting things above God. That's idolatry. Anything you put above God or in the place of God is an idol. Nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. None of these categories will, will enter the kingdom of God. It's a fallacy when people come and pretend like knowledge and they say, well, you know, in Paul's day, he didn't really know about homosexuality and all of that. That's why the Bible is like a bit antiquated, antiquated, that thing, it's old. And... Uh, <laughs> That's a fallacy. Why? In Rome, it was the most heinous society. Anything went sexually in Rome. They were male slaves, often younger, who were used as the sexual objects of men in Rome. It was common. Nero, Emperor, Emperor Nero, among his many people that he married, he married um, one of his male slaves, castrated him, and said that this is going to be his wife. So, so things that we're talking about in this day and age are not new. They're not new. Homosexual marriages are not new. They were happening in Rome. And then Nero, because he, he was crazy, he also went out, and there's a historical record, he went out and then he married another man and became the wife to that man. Now, this was going on in society. It was not like that society was different to ours. But look, not what Paul says. These issues, any of these sins, including the ones we do, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's be clear. The third C, compassion, clarity. The third C, Christ. Christ. We've got to bring Christ into the issue of homosexuality. Why? Carries on. And he says, and such were some of you. The church is not a gathering of perfect people who, who were born and have never done anything wrong. Amen? Amen? And Paul says, and such were some of you. People sitting in his audience there in Corinth had been involved in all of these things. Guess what? People sitting in this room have been involved in most probably all of these things as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And such were some of you. But what happened? But when Christ came into your life, you were washed. You were washed. The stain of your sin was washed. You were washed. You were sanctified. You started to change. Amen? And let's not believe this lie that if you're caught up in homosexuality, you can never change. You were born this way. And you no, the Bible says you can change. But you were washed, but you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the Spirit of God that helps all of us, not just fornicators and drunkards to live right, but homosexuals, sodomites, all of us to live right. So we need compassion. We need clarity. We need Christ. And finally, we need community. We need community. It's time for us as a church to invite the broken, the bruised, the confused into community. To come and say, walk with us. Amen. And stop treating them like modern day lepers. What is the church? The church is a place where we are all seeking Christ. 
The church is a place where we're all growing to be like Christ. The church is a place, an environment where we allow Christ to transform us. We're seeking, we're growing, and we're transforming around Christ. He's the standard. Amen. And we've got to invite people from those communities into the church, into the community, so that they too can seek, can grow, can transform. Oh, but Timber, homosexuality is just so vile, so horrible. Verse 28. And even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which were not fitting, being filled with all ungodliness. Everyone say all. All? All, all unrighteousness. Hmm. Paul goes on to list 22 different sin issues that fall into all unrighteousness. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Isn't it strange that we can look at these 22 issues and think that the first two examples Paul uses are worse than the rest? Right? It's like, no, no, no. Those, things, those two issues are the worst, but the rest is fine. No, no, no. Paul is going after all of us. That's why in Romans 3, verse 23, Paul ends off his argument and he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 32. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things, which things? Homosexuality? <laughs> Lesbianism? No. Who practice these things? The 22 things he's just mentioned plus the others. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same things themselves, but also approve of those who practice them. Chapter 2. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge, another person you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance, but in accordance with the hardness of your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. <sighs> Eternal life to those who, by patient continuance in doing good, seek, to, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath 
tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. I know it's a sobering message this morning. I know it's tough. But I've got good news for you. The good news is that in Christ Jesus, we have a way of escape. Every single person. There are no categories of sin. The Bible says in the book of James that if you have broken one part of the law, you're guilty of breaking it all. So we can't look at some people and say they are worse sinners. In exactly the same way as you say they're worse sinners, you are appreciating the fact that in your own sin, you deserve that worse judgment as well. But the Bible says that Jesus Christ came and took our place. The judgment that was due for us, he took on himself. The Bible said God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. That in Christ Jesus, we would become the righteousness of God. Now we have right standing with God. And it's not an intellectual thing. No, the Bible says if anyone's in Christ Jesus, they become a new creation. We become different. There's a life inside of us. The Bible calls it being born again. We start a new life. This is the good news. Jesus came to change us so that we can be right with God. Amen? Amen? Amen. That is the good news. That is the good news. Let's pray. Whew, Father, Father, we want to start off by repenting for judging other people who do different sins to us as worse sinners. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, of the way that we've spoken out against the homosexual community, even in our jokes and, and our careless words. Forgive us, Father. May we see them as people loved by you, created in your image. I pray, Father that we would use the same standard in our own lives, that we are called to a righteous life, that we can't be living in immorality and think we'll inherit the kingdom of God. But Father, we want to be washed, sanctified, justified in you. And Father, I thank you, Lord God, that this is the gateway to freedom, and Father, I thank you that you're calling us, Lord, to a higher place of freedom in you, in Jesus' name. And if you're here today and, and you realize that you're not living right, you're not right with God, and you need to become right with God. Maybe you're walking with God, but you've strayed, and you need to come back to the Father's house. I'd love to pray with you. Perhaps you're here this morning and you realize that, Timber, you know what? I actually need to be born again. I actually need to give my life to Christ. If that's you, it will be an honor to pray with you this morning to receive Jesus Christ. And if that's you, I want to encourage you just to raise your hand. I'd love to pray with you. Who's here this morning and says, Timber, that's me. I want to come back to the Father's house. I want to live right. Was there anyone at all? Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy that are revealed in the gospel. Awaken us to the gospel, Father. Awaken us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, God bless you. Next week we'll be in chapter 3. Have a look tomorrow morning. We'll have a study guide on our WhatsApp groups. Uh, for those of you who are visiting for the first time, please, first, second, third time, whatever, please come meet us um, in the breakaway room down the passage, first door on your right.
would love to meet you say hi and for anyone who needs prayer for anything we've got a great prayer team who'd love to minister to you and pray for you this morning for any need that you might have guys god bless you thanks for being here this sunday and happy father's day amen